Friday night as we celebrate with our Tenebrae service, a service of light and shadow, as we remember the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior and how wonderful that is for us. Delighted to see you all here. I thank you all for coming. I just want to remind you, of course, that we will have no worship tomorrow as Saturday is our day of waiting and waiting. Sunday morning, though, we will gather together again at 6.30 in the morning for our sunrise service and at 9 o'clock for our festival service. So we hope that you are able to join us for as much of that as possible. In between our services on Sunday, of course, is our Easter breakfast uh, from our youth. So please join us for that. We begin in the, f the first page of your bulletin. We gather to worship tonight in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Behold the life-giving cross, on which was hung the Savior of the whole world. O come, let us worship him. Behold the life-giving cross, on which was hung the Savior of the whole world. O come, let us worship him. Behold the life-giving cross, on which was hung the Savior of the whole world. O come, let us worship him. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. By your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. We join together in our first hymn, number 351.
we continue back in the front part of your bulletin with the ancient solemn reproaches, uh, traditional in the Good Friday service of the church. For your sake I scourged Egypt with its firstborn, and you delivered me up to be scourged. Holy God, holy and mighty, have mercy on us. I delivered you out of Egypt, and you delivered me to the chief priests. Holy God, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. I opened the sea before you, and you opened my side with a spear. Holy God, holy and mighty, have mercy on us. I led you with a pillar of cloud in the wilderness, and you led me to the judgment hall of Pilate. Holy God, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. I fed you with manna in the desert, and you beat me with blows and whips. Holy God, holy and mighty, have mercy on us. I gave you water from a rock to drink in your wandering, and you gave me gall and vinegar for my thirst. Holy God, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. For your sake I struck the kings of the Canaanites and gave you the promised land, and you struck my head with a reed. Holy God, holy and mighty, have mercy on us. I gave you a royal inheritance, and you gave me a crown of thorns for my head. Holy God, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. I lifted you with great strength and an eternal baptismal promise, and you lifted me on a cross. Holy God, holy and mighty, have mercy on us.
Our first reading this evening is from the 53rd chapter of the prophet Isaiah. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole. And by his bruises, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered among the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Here ends the first reading. Our second reading is from Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me, from the words of my groaning? O my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our ancestors trusted, they trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm, and not human, scorned by others and despised by the people. All who see me mock at me, they make mouths at me, they shake their heads. Commit your cause to the Lord, let him deliver. Let him rescue the one in whom he delights. Here ends the reading. Let us join together in our next hymn, number 347, Go to Dark Gethsemane.
I know it says in the bulletin that our gospel lesson is from John, but it's actually from the gospel of Matthew. I made a mistake when we were printing, uh, putting together the bulletins. Um, so from this 27th chapter of Matthew, verses 24 through 49, and if you, if you are able, please rise for the reading of the gospel lesson. Now when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd and said, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. Then the people as a whole answered, His blood be upon us and upon our children. Then Pilate re released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole co cohort around him, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. Then they put a reed in his right hand, and they knelt down before him, and they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him, and then they led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they came upon a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over his head they put a sign with the charges against him, which read, This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Two bandits were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. And in the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and the elders, mocked him, saying, He saved others, but he cannot save himself. If he is the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross now, and then we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he wants to. For he said, I am God's son. The bandits who were crucified with him also taunted him in this way. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. About three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard his words, they said, He is calling for Elijah. At once one of them ran and got a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. <coughs> the Gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those are maybe what I think are the most forlorn, saddest words from the cross. Maybe from the whole life of Jesus, the most depressing. It doesn't sound right coming from Jesus, does it? It doesn't sound right to me, to my ears, that it would come from Jesus' mouth. You know, it's okay for us to say, 
Why have you forsaken me, God? Because we're chronic complainers. We do a lot of whining, and it doesn't take much for us to say, Don't you care anymore, God? Have you deserted me? You know, it only takes one little problem out of the day for us to cry out. But for Jesus to say those words, for Jesus to say, My God, why have you forsaken me? That's a different matter. It doesn't, doesn't sound right coming from him. After all, he's the Lord. He's the Son of God. He's not supposed to cry out in despair, is he? Even if he is on the cross. I think these words show just how great and just how painful Jesus' sacrifice was for each of us. It was so painful that he would say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's a cry of abandonment. It's a cry of aloneness. Had God forsaken Jesus? Was Jesus losing his faith, wondering why he had been faithful? Don't you remember the, the words of Psalm 23? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. That's what it says in the Psalms. That's what we believe. And yet, here we hear from Jesus a cry of being utterly neglected, completely abandoned, forsaken. Well, we know he was abandoned. I mean, all of his disciples abandoned him, right? All of his followers. And, and he was abandoned by all of those people. I guess that's what we expect of some humans. But had God, his heavenly Father, forsaken him also? For us, I think it's easier to say, when a tragedy comes along, God must have abandoned me, or disowned me, or left me out on my own. The feeling of being forsaken often comes with the loss or the death of a loved one, or a marriage, or a job, or our health, or maybe just some little tragedy, something that just doesn't go right during the day. We feel like God is nowhere to be found, especially in times of deep pain or sorrow. Well, Jesus was suffering great pain, wasn't he? I mean, after all, he was on the cross. If you or I had been nailed to the cross and had our lifeblood dripping, flowing out of our feet and hands, we would probably cry out in anguish also, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why have you forsaken me? There's another way of uh, looking at this, a couple different ways of looking at this. One is that Jesus, in this great suffering, this deep pain and approaching death on the cross, calls out to God, my God, my God. Even though, even though it appears God had forsaken him, he cries out, my God, why have you forsaken me? And maybe in our darkest hour, that's what we need to do is to cry out to God. When we feel abandoned or forsaken by God, cry out, my God, where are you? Where are you? You know, it says in the scriptures that Jesus was tempted in every way as we are, even to the point of feeling like he was abandoned by God. If we feel like we are abandoned by God, does that mean we are abandoned by God? Just because we don't feel his presence, we don't feel him close at our side, we don't feel like we're safe, does that mean that we are abandoned? I don't think so. That's not what the scriptures say. The scriptures say even if, we, even if our parents abandon us, our Lord does not abandon us. His presence does not depend on our feelings. 
in the devotional book that we're using for Lent, there was a quote for today from Corey Ten Boom that says, there is no pit so deep that God's love is not deeper still. There is no pit so deep that God's love is not deeper still. God's presence, God doesn't check on us to take our temperature and see how we're feeling, whether we feel like he is close or not, for him to be there. He is, whether we feel like it or not. Jesus is with us when we cry out in pain or sadness or when we have feelings of abandonment. He knows what we're going through. He understands. He's been through it himself. That's what was going on on the cross. There's nothing, no pain or agony that we feel that Christ hasn't experienced. He was human in all ways like us. And he does not abandon us when we are in that situation. Another thing I was thinking about is uh, some questions about Jesus as the Messiah, the prophecies. You know, there are prophecies about Jesus that as the Messiah, he would preach good news to the poor. He would open the gates of the prisoners. He would open the eyes of the blind and give release to the captives. And he would strengthen the knees of the lame so that they could walk. And there are many prophecies about great things that Christ would do. And yes, Christ fulfilled all of these things. He accomplished all those good things. But then there are other words about the Messiah that even though he did all of these miraculous and marvelous and wonderful things, cleansing lepers, feeding the 5,000, giving sight to the blind, adhering to the deaf, and opening the tongues of those who were mute, and strengthening weak knees so the lame could walk, and forgiving sins, and casting out demons, and even raising the dead. Somehow, even though he did all of those wonderful, marvelous things, in Isaiah 53, which Pastor Brian read, it says, even though he did all of these marvelous things, he would be despised and rejected. It's hard to believe after doing all those great things, he would be despised and rejected, that he would suffer and be struck down and be afflicted for our sins, for our transgressions and our iniquities, that he would bear our punishment so that we might be healed. All of those good things about Jesus are part of the picture, but they are not all of the picture. We also have Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22. The Savior, the Son of God, will do great and good things. And it's hard to believe, but he will also suffer. Who can believe it, Isaiah starts saying. It is hard to believe, but he does also suffer, that he might bring us healing. I wanted to, uh, when Jesus cries out and he says, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's quoting Psalm 22 or praying Psalm 22, you might say. He's not just crying out in anguish aimlessly, just crying out raving against God. He is quoting scripture, the first line of Psalm 22. <laughs> We heard some of this psalm, but I want to read a few more verses of this psalm. If I can pick up my Bible instead of my hymnal. <laughs> this is my first time back for about six weeks, so I'm, I'll get to it. Yeah, he says, my God, my God, the psalmist says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? I cry out, but you do not answer. In, our, in you, our ancestors trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried out to you and they were saved. They trusted in you and they were not put to shame. But what about me? So I'm scorned by others and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me and they shake their heads. 
They say, commit your cause to the Lord and let the Lord deliver him. Let the Lord rescue the one in whom he delights. That sounds a lot like the passion story, doesn't it? When Christ says that first line of Psalm 22, he's maybe thinking of all this rest of the psalm and pointing us toward that psalm. Trouble is near, and there is no one to help, the psalmist says. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint, which is what happens when you're crucified. Bones start coming apart. My heart is like wax, and it is melted within my breast. My mouth is dried out like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. Yes, I thirst, one of Jesus' words. Dogs are all around me, and a company of evildoers encircles me. My hands and my feet have been pierced. They can count all my bones. They stare and they gloat over me. They divide my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. That sounds a lot like Jesus, and I think that's what he was thinking of and referring us to, kind of pushing us to think about when he is on the cross. And not just that part of the psalm, but then the last part of the psalm too, because the last part of the psalm is the part that brings com comfort. It says, the Lord did not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. He didn't turn away. He didn't look away in shame and ignore the affliction of the afflicted. He did not hide his face from me, but he heard me when I cried to him. And he says, all the families of the nations will worship him, for dominion belongs to our Lord who rules over the nations. To him, indeed, shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. That's the dead, right? To him, all those who sleep in the earth will bow down. Before, before him shall bow down all who have gone down to the dust, and I shall live for him. When I die, I shall live for him. It's talking about eternal life. It's talking about Easter, I think. Future generations will be told about the Lord, and they will proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn. They will tell what the Lord has done. The psalm doesn't end in despair. It ends talking about eternal life and resurrection. We're talking tonight about the seven last words a little bit in just a little bit in the service. But the seven last words are not the last words. <laughs> there are other words that we will hear on Easter, and there are other words that will be told from generation to generation about those who have gone down in the dust and those who trusted in the Lord and those who yet live even though they have died. The story of the crucifixion is a very crucial part of the story. I think it's about a third of the Gospels are spent in the Passion of Christ. That's a very important part that Christ died for us. But it is not the ending, and it is not the last word. We will hear many more words from Christ. We will hear many more words from Christ for many generations. Let us pray. God, our Father, we thank you for these words of Jesus that lets us know that he suffered as much and more than any of us can ever suffer, and that he is with us in that suffering. He knows what it's like, and he does not abandon us. We thank you for these words that direct us to other parts of Scripture where we hear the rest of the story. Death is not the last word, but there are other words that will come in the future. And we pray that you would help us to be thankful for all that Christ has done and to appreciate the depths of anguish which he descended to, that we might be saved. This we pray in his most holy name. Amen. 
Let us now confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed, and that's printed in the back cover of the bulletin, I mean the back cover of the hymnal, and if you are able, uh, please rise at this time. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. The first word, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. From Luke 23, verses 32 through 38. Two others also, who were criminals, were led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place that is called the Skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing, and the people stood by watching, but the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, Save yourself. There was also an inscription over him. This is the king of the Jews. Let us pray together the prayer printed in your bulletin. Holy, Holy Jesus, Jesus, thank, thank you, you for, for speaking, speaking a word of forgiveness. forgiveness. If, you if you had waited until we understood the wrong we do, you would have had to wait forever. You reached out to us in love and grace, stretching your arms out wide. So wide they ended up on a cross. Forgive us. We do not know what we do. Amen. Our Savior speaks in grace with words of mercy true. Forgive them, Father. They know not what they do.
The second word, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. One of the criminals who were hanged with Jesus kept deriding him and kept saying, are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, do you not fear God since you are also under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man, he has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Let us pray. Holy Jesus, paradise, paradise truly, truly is having a relationship with you. Help, Help us remember, remember that, that we, we are, are called to that relationship now, today, today not sometime in the future. We, we thank, thank you, you that you offer that relationship to all of us, no matter who we are or what we have done or where we are. Help us to live today and every day in relationship with you. Amen. His wondrous pity see, unto the thief he cries, Today I tell you, you will be with me in paradise. The third word, woman, behold your son, behold your mother. John 19, 25 through 27. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. Let us pray. Holy, Holy Jesus, Jesus, on, on the, the cross, cross you created a new family a family formed from love rather than genetics. Thank you for adopting us into this family through our baptisms. Forgive us for not always accepting all of your children as family and help us to see one another as brothers and sisters, no matter how different we are from one another. Amen. Amen. To Mary looking on, Behold your son, he says. Behold your mother. Thus on John love's burden gently lays. The fourth word, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? From then on, from noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, this man is now calling for Elijah. At once, one of them ran and got a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Let us pray. Holy Jesus, 
we confess that we sometimes have trouble in the dark. When life gets hard, when despair, disease, and death surround us, it gets hard to see you. Thank you for entering the dark on the cross so that we are never alone there. When we feel lost in that dark, Keep that image of your bleeding, whipped body before our eyes and give us the comfort of knowing that you know what we are going through. Amen. Now hear the awful cry, sin's dreadful burden see. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The fifth word, I thirst, John 19, 28 through 29. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. Let us pray. Holy Jesus, in the face of the pain and loneliness of the cross, you cried out in thirst. Forgive us when we try to spiritualize your death and our faith. Remind us of how real and down to earth you have called us to be. Give us a thirst for justice and righteousness that matches your own. Amen. As one of us dies, sin's power has done its worst. From hell's dread agony, he cries a simple word, I thirst.
The sixth word, it is finished. John 19, verse 30, the first half of the verse. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished, and then he bowed his head. Let us pray. Holy Jesus, thank, thank you, you for all you did for us on the cross. cross. Forgive, Forgive us for arrogantly thinking that we can do something to save ourselves. ourselves. You, you have, have done, done all there is, there is to do. You, you have, have loved us, saved us, redeemed us, and claimed us. us. Help, Help us to stop working and striving for just, for just a few, a few minutes. minutes and stand, and stand in, in awe, awe before, before the cross, remembering what you have done for us. Amen. Amen. Tis finished, says the Lord, the burden on him laid of sinful thought and deed and word. The debt is fully paid. The seventh word, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Luke 23, 46 to 48. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. When the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God and said, Certainly, this man was innocent. And when all the crowds who had gathered there for this spectacle saw what had taken place, they returned home, beating their breasts. Let us pray. Holy, Holy Jesus, Jesus. In, In your, your last, last moments, you, you handed, handed over your, your spirit, spirit willingly, willingly, trustingly, fully into the hands of the Father. Forgive us for thinking that our lives are our own, that we are in control, that we possess anything. Help us to remember that all we have and all we are is a gift from you. Help us to give, to give our lives over to you, you as you gave, gave your life for us. us. Amen. Amen. Father, into your hands my spirit I commend, and he who hears and understands receives us in the end.
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.